brother lord thank you so much for matt and karen making them part of our family and um just thank you for their hearts lord their their devotion to you their commitment to you and their loyalty to you jesus and i pray now that you would speak to us through this your servant in jesus name amen 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 yeah we're not here to entertain you not here to amuse you we want to grow with you in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen for the worship, huh? Isn't it awesome? No matter where you're at, we're worshiping. The Father hears our, our worship, hears the cries of our heart. Man, it's so good having a good shepherd. Um, so turn to John chapter 10. We'll get there in a moment. Um, I just want to tell a story. I was reading a story about two men who were watching a man drive a herd of sheep through the main street in Jerusalem. One of the men said to the other, I thought shepherds led the sheep. I don't know, I didn't know they drove them with a whip. They do, the other man said. That's not the shepherd, that's the butcher. You see, sheep need to be led. They need to be guided. And it's important that they're led in truth and in love and not driven unto their death. See, sheep will follow. It's what they do. And it depends on who's shepherding them. So who's shepherding you this morning is my question. You know, often we see people who claim to be Christians, but yet they're defeated. They're worn out. They're beat up because their shepherd's been driving them and, and heading them to the slaughter rather than leading them into the pasture where they can find rest for their weary souls. So we see this picture of a sheep and a shepherd all throughout the Bible. God designed it. He designed his people to be led, and he designed his people to be shepherded. And so just to set the scene for you, in John chapter 7, a few chapters back, we see Jesus is heading to the Feast of the Tabernacles. And up until this point in John's gospel, Jesus has been teaching individual, individually, doing miracles, uh, uh, talking to his disciples, training and equipping them. And, and he say, keeps saying that his time had not yet come. So here he is in John chapter 7, he goes into the Feast of Tabernacles, which is also known, I think is very interesting, as the Harvest Feast, where they celebrated the harvest at the end of the year. And so I'll pick it up here in verse 37 of John chapter 7, and it says, On the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So we see Jesus who's been teaching individually and, and, and performing miracles and doing these things and telling people, hold on, my time's not come. Now he is here in the temple and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which were members of the Sanhedrin, which were supposed to be the religious leaders, they began a plot to kill him. See, they realized that he was a threat to what they had built and to what they had established, and that was religion. See, the Sanhedrin, to give you a, a backstory, they, they appear in the book of Numbers, and God gave these men to help govern his people along with Moses and with the high priest Aaron at the tent of meeting. You see, in Exodus, as God led his people out of Egypt, heading towards the promised, man, he, a promised land, he set up the role of leadership through Moses and the role of the high priest to spiritually shepherd the people. And he establishes the Levitical priesthood practices to guide the people and to point the nation of Israel to the coming Messiah. And throughout history, they were to teach and to equip the people of God in God's laws and in God's truth. And they were to perform the duties of the sacrifices of cleansing from sin and to take care of and to shepherd God's people. But over time, the Sanhedrin seemed to have lost their way. They became less spiritual and became more political. And then what we see of the Pharisees starts to transform into who they were at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry during the second temple period in Jewish history, around 500 B.C. leading to 70 A.D. 
And we see them being splintered and brought out to different groups during the time of Christ and the early church. See, the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, they were, they were there and began to fight for the control of the Jewish people. The Pharisees were the influential religious group. They were known for their emphasis on personal piety, for their acceptance of oral tradition and school of thought in addition to the written law. And they began to teach that all the Jews should observe over 600 plus laws found in the Torah of which they couldn't even uphold for themselves. The Pharisees were mostly businessmen and leaders in the synagogue. They held very few positions as priests, but they held a great majority in the people and in decision making because the people followed them. But yet they didn't care for them. They controlled them through man-made laws when they should have been shepherding the people of God. It became a preference-driven flock where traditions were being driven and not led to control the flock. They were being driven by tradition, which is nothing more than being bullied from the grave. And God came and sent his son Jesus to draw them out of what was burdening them and give them rest for their weary souls. So then we hear, we pick it up in John chapter 10, and Jesus is ministering to the people at the Feast of Tabernacles, calling them into repentance out of these religious practices that were established by rules and doctrines of men. They were simply loosely based on the law of Moses and the twisting of God's written truth. But let me set the scene. I love in chapter 9 of John, Jesus heals this man who was born blind. And the Pharisees begin to interrogate him. And they begin to interrogate his family members because they were seeking to trap Jesus because what he did was actually on the Sabbath. So he was breaking one of their laws. And they eventually come to the decision to excommunicate this man by throwing him out of the synagogue and throwing him out of the religion of Judaism, which was a big deal. It meant loss of being part of a family. It meant the loss of the ability to practice the only religion he ever knew of. He began to be rejected by his peers. Essentially what took place was he was a sheep that was tossed out of the lost flock of Judaism the wayward sheep of Israel. And we see Jesus finds him and he brings him into his own flock, his sheepfold. And he begins to teach the people during the celebration of the harvest at a place known as Solomon's porch where the, what was known as the sheep gate. Jesus loved to use these images. And there he is at the sheep gate and he begins to explain the difference between a bad shepherd and a good shepherd. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word as we get ready to open up and unpack John chapter 10. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you speak to our hearts. Father, we bind the enemy who would want nothing more than us to be distracted instead of being reminded that we belong to you and that we're your sheep and you're our good shepherd. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask God that you would speak to us as your children. Minister to our spirits. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we see here in verse 1 of John 10, Jesus stands up and, and begins to teach the people. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. See, Jesus calls out the Pharisees. The Pharisees had secured their power through illegitimate means. These were men who usurped God's design for his flock, God's design for his church, God designs for his people, and he took, they took another way to lead and to shepherd the people. You see, he calls his people throughout Scripture sheep, because sheep were known for not being the brightest animal on the planet. And he calls us sheep. Don't take offense to that. We're stubborn, we're selfish, and we're stupid if we're honest. See, God tells us we're sheep. Take it up with him. It's not my words. See, and he tells us that they needed a shepherd. Sheep will follow anything. 
and they won't recognize danger. It's the importance of having an under-shepherd over a flock or over a church. You see, because sheep won't recognize the danger that's coming, the sin they're falling into. They won't recognize when someone else says, hey, I heard this, let's go over here. And they don't realize that they're going over the cliff because when once goes, they all start to follow over, eventually leading to their own demise. And also sheep were known for wandering off. So in the ancient times, in ancient cities, we see that they built these pens where the shepherd could bring, bring his flock to keep them safe. It was usually a walled area with one door. And many sheep were brought together from different flocks. And they hired a doorman who would, sit, who would keep them and sit there all night and protect them from being stolen and protect them from wolves and protect them from the other elements and even protect them from themselves. And the shepherd would come and get them in the morning and he would lead them out to pasture The sheep would know the voice, and they would come only when their shepherd is called. And unlike the thief, the true shepherd would come through the door. Now think of Jesus entering in the the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles, coming through the door of the temple, walking up amongst the people, and standing there in a loud voice and begin to call them out. Pocket the doorkeeper reference in verse 3 for a moment. We'll get to that in just a minute. Jesus, the good shepherd, comes and sees the wayward sheep and begins to call them out and teach them and shepherd them. You see, I love it that Christianity can be summed up in two words. Follow me. Not a church, not a man. Follow Jesus Christ. And we see in verse 4 through 6, and when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand in which the things he spoke to them. You see, the word brings out that he used there is the same word used in John chapter 9 when the Pharisees are casting out this man who was born blind and kicking him out of the fold. These false shepherds put out the sheep to rid themselves of trouble. And when things weren't done their way, they forgot that ministry was messy. And when it gets tough, you got to be there to disciple and to teach, not to reject and not to throw out, but to love them through their struggles. See, the true shepherd does that. He brings out his sheep in order to feed and to take care of them. And the true sheep of God, they know the voice of the true shepherd. A false shepherd, the sheep wouldn't know. Even though they weren't the brightest animal, they knew who their shepherd was. And sheep would not follow a stranger's voice, even when he imitated the the shepherd's tone. I mean, think about how many times throughout Scripture you hear Jesus saying, those who have ears to hear, Do you hear our good shepherd's voice? Become a discerner of truth and what's false. I'm often think of the the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 where Paul says that they were of more noble people than those around them because they didn't just listen to somebody teach or preach the word and fall sway to every wind of doctrine, but they went to the word of God and they began to see, is this guy teaching the very word of the good shepherd? It's the importance of knowing your Bible. It's the importance of knowing Scripture where you can hear God's word, the very voice of him. His sheep know it. It's why we offer these different Bible studies to get involved in, the where you go, I go with the Oasis women and, and the men's study and the awakenings so we can be the doorkeeper. We're not the shepherds. We just want to open up your heart to let the good shepherd can lead and guide you. And we know that unless you're hearing from his word, you're not going to be guided properly. You're going to be swayed. See, Satan knows this. It's why he tries so hard to bring doubt into the word of God. Since the very garden, remember he came in, did God really say? He began to bring doubt into the word of God, doubt of the voice of the good shepherd. Did you really hear God say that? We know that God gave us his word so we can know him and understand his ways and in his thoughts. So the enemy sends false teachers and false shepherds and they use a little bit of truth and they blend it with falseness. It's the same thing the Pharisees did 
when they added over 600 rules and regulations that became a burden and a yoke of bondage on the people. I mean, we often hear our pastor, Pastor Robert, say, don't let my light be your law. It's important to know what God requires of you. It's important that we center our convictions based on the good shepherd's heart, his word. See, many false teachers will twist and add to it for their personal gain. They don't want to care for the flock. They want to control them. So they add these other rules and regulations that do nothing more than burden. And we begin to realize, I can't walk this out. There's no hope. Let me just go back to what I was doing. At least I found some sense of relief and help when I was there. So whose voice are you listening to? What does your shepherd require of you? Hear from him, follow him, and obey him. You see, Jesus goes on in John 10, verses 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, Jesus is the door to salvation. John 14, 6, he tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through him. He's the only way. See, the Pharisees tried to make their own ways with laws and regulations, and they became nothing more than blind guides who were leading the people astray. And Jesus had some harsh words for them, and he had some harsh words for other shepherds now of his church who seek to put their own platform over the, over the pasture of the sheep. In Matthew 23, 1 through 15, we read this. Jesus spoke to the multitudes, to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, where the Sanhedrin was supposed to govern the people. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, observe and do, but do not do according to their works. They're teaching you the law, but they're not obeying it themselves. For they say and they do not do, for they were bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they laid them on men's shoulders." But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They wanted the place. They wanted the status. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love to look spiritual and look religious and look important. They love the places at the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greeting in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They love the title, but you do not be called Rabbi, he said said to his disciples for one is your teacher and that is the Christ and you are all brethren do not call anyone on earth your father for one is your father who is in heaven and do not be called teachers for one is your teacher the Christ but he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant and whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted but woe to you scribes and Pharisees you hypocrites For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow others to enter and go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. You love to look spiritual, but you're just robbing people. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Ouch. I mean, they thought they were the ones, and Jesus stands up and says, you guys have no idea. See, the Pharisees' goal was to control the people. They led the people astray to maintain their own power, their own greed, their own status. They were full of pride and they were full of self-indulgence. Just like many false teachers and prophets that we see in the church today. It's the many reasons why people don't come to Christ or don't come to a church. Because they're like, I don't want no part of that. They itch ears. They kill people, they they steal from them, and they destroy people's faith through deceptive doctrines and rules and regulations. These word of faith preachers who talk a big game but don't walk it out. 
They're just like sin. They overpromise and underdeliver, and they lead people away from God's truth and the real life of abundance. They lead them astray, and they seek for a false sense of security, and they lie and deceive the people so into my ministry. They put hope in provision rather than in the provider, and the end result, it ends in hell. I think of these faith healers and these prosperity preachers who promised health and wealth and wisdom. And they said this, sow into this, pray this prayer, do this, and you won't be sick. You shouldn't be sick. You shouldn't be broke. And if you are, you somehow, and they preach and they sell this goods for sale, and they end up leaving people broke, doubting, and sick, and turning them away from God. And many people in our world are upset with God by what man has done. And I'm here to tell you, listen, stop being upset with God for what man has done, because God has always been faithful, and God has always been true. And it's why we need to put our hope in him alone, and in studying his word, and not be deceived by these hirelings who flee when the people truly need them, leaving them wide open and pray for the wolves. I mean, I often think about this pandemic hitting our world that affects everybody. No one's immune from it. No one's exempt from it. And I often think these faith healers and these prosperity teachers, man, they've been training and preparing for this moment their entire ministry, promising health, wealth, and wisdom. But now we see the reality, leaving people sick, broke, and confused wondering what's next what happened where are you God because you know what I don't see any of them offering that now they're like birds chirp 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 chirp. you hear crickets where are you at this is your moment but see scripture warns us about those type of men to stay away from them and he warns us pastors that we like it says in Acts 20 verse 28 therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Jesus calls us to him, and he reminds us that he is the good shepherd and that he alone will take care of the sheep, and he will bring healing for them. He alone will heal them spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And he provides for their every need. Why do you think the psalmist wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You lead me to still pastors. You restore my soul. You prepare a place in the presence of my enemy. And God, I'll be with you for all of eternity. You see, Jesus was a, the lamb who purchased us back. He gave his own life for us. The worthy, sacrificial lamb of God who took away the sins of the earth. And he's a servant written about In Isaiah chapter 53, he himself bore our sins. He himself took our punishment. And by his stripes, we are healed. Let's get closer to the shepherd during this time than we've ever been. You see, Jesus in John 10, as we continue in verse 11, he says these words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he is not the shepherd. One who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. And the hiring flees because he is a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. You see, the role of the Pharisees was to care for the flock, not control them. The role of pastors is to care for the flock, not to control them. To actually be the doorkeeper that you read about in verse 3. One who opens the door of the people's hearts and leads them to the good shepherd, the one who restores their souls. There's no greater privilege than to connect people with the good shepherd when they're hurting and they're burdened. Are you connecting people with God? Are you giving them rules and regulations and things to do and things to say so they can get through this? No, connect them to the shepherd. He'll bring peace which passes all understanding. See, the role of the Pharisees and the role of pastors today are nothing more than to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to be prepared for times like this. Not be like hirelings who were only there for a paycheck. So into this. True shepherds are in it for the outcome, not for the income. 
They guard the sheep for the good shepherd, knowing they'll give an account and an answer and receive a crown of glory when we do it in a way that brings God glory. See, bad shepherds, they do for self. Real shepherds, they do for others. And I'm so thankful for our pastor who has the heart of a shepherd in the way he shepherds us. For the first time, we're in the midst of crazy times in a pandemic of so much uncertainty, and he's doing his very best as a man of God to hear from the Father and lead us in a way that we would be strengthened and united evermore. Don't forget to lift him up in prayer. I'm thankful for him and being my pastor and how he shepherds us. I'm thankful to have a man of God in my life that cares more about the father than he really does about the flock because you have to know God in order to shepherd people correctly and that's where he goes and I appreciate that so much. He doesn't try to control us. He's trying to care for us and I can't imagine the decisions and the things he's trying to make now as he shepherds us through this time. Pray for him and be grateful for him. God has blessed us indeed. He understands what 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4 says, to shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those who entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. See, there are many bad shepherds who don't understand their role. They elevate themselves and they, think a plat- they, they seek a platform, but they don't want the pasture. They want to twist and distort, and they are wolves in sheep clothing. They love to be, follow my YouTube, follow it. No, follow God. Don't follow YouTube. Don't follow Twitter. Don't follow these things. Follow God. And they say, oh, look, listen to me. I got it all figured out. No, they don't. That's why they're not with the sheep. They're stuck in a little room with a screen behind them talking about how they have so much knowledge and they want to draw people to themselves and they actually, in a way, draw them further away from God. Jesus gave a stern warning in Matthew 7 of these people. He tells us in verse 13 to be aware of these false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit, and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Lord, Lord, have we cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, they sell the gifts in replace of the gift giver. Not the gospel, not the Christ, the, the Savior, but man, the one. So here, do this. Be about this. Do you speak in tongues? Can you do healing? Do you do all this? It's the gift giver. And God cares little about what you do for him. What matters is what you do with him. Is he your shepherd? Do you hear his voice? Do you seek to save the lost? Do you care about people that are around you? Or are you only trying to build a platform? You see, that's exactly where the Jewish nation was when Christ came thousands of years they've been ravished and burdened by so many rules and regulations and troubles the roman empire was taxing them of their money and the religious leaders were shaking them down for what was left for their own greed and their own status and the people were harassed and helpless without hope And we see in Matthew chapter 9 that Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. 
And he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray of the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So there's Jesus in the great feast of the tabernacles, the feast of the harvest, and he's calling people out of their dead religious practices and their burdensome rules and regulations and to follow and to do church. And he says, no, no, I'm calling you to something different, something much greater, and something that's much better. And it's the same thing we see in our world today. People without hope, helpless, harassed, like sheep without a shepherd, even in some churches. And many people don't realize that they could be led by the good shepherd rather than controlled by a poor shepherd. That they must do and they must perform rather than be, be a sheep under the good shepherd. You see what I see? is people know less about the shepherd than they do about the flock. They're scattered, they're confused. And Jesus came to set them free and to set us free and to bring them into his fold. He came and laid down his life for a fallen, lost, hopeless in humanity. And he gave his life as a ransom for many where he died on the cross and was buried and rose again on the third day as it was prophesied, as it was taught. And us as believers, we have a role in God's goal. We have a part in his heart to know him and to make him known, to call lost sheep to the fold of God. How do you see people? It'll be a good indicator of who your shepherd is. Listen to what he says here as we close out in John 10, verses 14 through 16. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not in this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. See, the other sheep were not just the Jews, but Gentiles. God's design has always been one flock and tells the salvation of the Gentiles and the formation of his church in which converted Jews and Gentiles would form one spiritual flock, one spiritual body. Isaiah 56, 8 tells us, the Lord God who gathers the outcast of Israel and says, yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. See, we've got to remember that God is not ethnocentric. His kingdom flock is going to be comprised of all nations, tribes, and tongues. And he calls all people to repentance. Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. And he calls people to quit wandering around this life seeking purpose, seeking hope, seeking a reason for existence through worldly means. And he places them in a family his flock, and he builds his church. And we're so thankful to be in an area where our church family is made up, and I use the word knucklehead, so I say that in love, made up of a bunch of knuckleheads that come from different countries and backgrounds and cultures and thoughts and and school things and taught this and different, you know, I love the different you know, variety of music and style of dress and artistic. I mean, only God can bring so many knuckleheads together that are selfish and bring him under one flock, under his lordship, and change and impact the community the way he's done through us. And we are so blessed by you guys, and we are so thankful how we see you guys seeking to be led by the good shepherd and do the work of the ministry and minister to a hurting culture right now with the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. We are so proud to be part of your flock and be a part of your family and we're so thankful for all that you guys are doing. You see, Paul would tell us about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11, 22 that we are one flock and with one good shepherd and it reminds us so much when I think about you guys in our church and how we are. It says, therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near to the, by the blood of Christ. 
For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, Therefore, putting to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to who were far off and those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father, Christ, who is our cornerstone. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're not Colombian. You're not Cuban. You're not Indian. You're not Philippine. Man, you are a child of God brought into his kingdom and his fold. And we can celebrate the goodness of God in that. You see, he says, we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And in verse 20, he says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple of the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. See, now that we are one family, now that he's pulled us from the world, from wandering and pulled us from religious practices and all these different things that burdened us down, God asks us to be ambassadors and appeal to others to come to salvation through Jesus Christ. He says, listen, I have other sheep that are out there I want to bring into my fold, and I want to use you guys to do that. The psalmist knew this in 100, Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. And he who has made us, and not we ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So God wants us to be and to build the flock, to be and to make disciples in unity of heart, in unity of spirit, in unity of truth, that we stand together and we form this chain that speaks and tells the testimony of the reality of who God is to the people around us. He told the Philippian church this way, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live your life like you've preached the gospel to yourself first, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel that we are working together to build his kingdom and to bring people into the lost fold of God that he could be their good shepherd and when we do that it is not in any way terrified but with the adversaries the gates of hell will not prevail against his church the gates of hell will not prevail against his flock because to them when we stand unified and we stand together it's proof of their perdition but it's also proof of our salvation and that's from God You see, God commands us that we live as one flock. And it's a testimony to the world around us. And not only did he command that, but he prayed for it. If you could hear Jesus audibly praying for you, that you would be a part of the flock, that you would be about the Lord's business, how would that radically change the mission you were on? How would that radically change the way you live your life, seeking to be unified and seeking to go and share the gospel with a hurting word around you? You see, Jesus prayed this in John 17. He says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. He wasn't trying to take us out. He wanted to keep us in but protect us from the evil one. They are not of this world just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world. I also send them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone but also for those who believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that you also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. We bring glory to the Father when we walk in unity of spirit and we walk in unity of truth and not be walls of separation and segregation, but, but, but breaking down them and building bridges of unity He prayed for that. He says that's the glory when he brings knuckleheads together under one mission. He ends it by saying that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them and as you have loved me. 
See, Christ builds his church, Christ leads his church, Christ shepherds his church, and he is among his church. And he gives us a great command. He gives us great marching orders. The very last thing he said to his disciples was, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what's the deal with all this? Why a good shepherd? Because just like in the early years of Israel's history, bad and false shepherds came in and tried to destroy it. Men that usurped the design of God and took over leading the people by controlling them rather than caring for them. And then we see in Acts the birth of his church and we see men of God that were just loving God and trying to do their best to lead the people. And we see that false shepherds and false teachers, Paul was constantly warning the people, pay attention to the word of God, be alone in the spirit, understand who your shepherd is. These people are trying to pull you away. They're not trying to get you closer. They want to control you, not care for you. And we see this in our world today. So us as a church this morning, let's unite in spirit and in truth, calling people to repentance, to Christ through grace by faith, bringing a lost world into the fold of God, just as he did us, being about the Father's business, just as he was. As the band comes to close us out in worship, let's be about the Father's business. Who's your shepherd today? You'll know by what you're doing. You'll know by your fruit. Are you loving people the way he loved them? Are you forgiving one another as he has forgiven us? Are you seeking and saving the lost sheep and bringing them into the flock of God so they can share in the abundant life that he alone gives? Church, we're in a great time. No greater time to be alive and be here, right? We can can see the sky cracking open and our Savior coming to rapture us and take us home. And never in any of our lives, we can honestly say this, a lot of times you see this, you've never experienced it. We have never experienced anything like this before. A pandemic coming, empty seats, but open hearts. People hearing the word of God. We've never been in a place where the fields are more ripe for harvest, where people are hurting and people are seeking answers among the chaos, and we as the sheep of God have them. They're seeking. Are you seeking them out? Healthy sheep reproduce. Are you reproducing? Who is your chief shepherd? If it's Christ, then let's be his church. See, in times of real trouble, the church has a real shepherd with real answers and real solutions. Let's go and share them and be about it. And if you're listening today and you've realized you've wandered off chasing the things of this world, or you've been deceived by someone who, who, who said that you pray this prayer and, and you'll be saved, but yet nothing's changed within you. There's no teaching, just controlling then come home into the flock. Come home to God this morning. Let him be your shepherd and lead you and guide you with love and care. And so, Father, I thank you for your word and your truth. Father, I thank you for the many men who shepherd your flock under the guidance of you, the good shepherd. None of us men are perfect, but you are. Help us to be reminded today that we're just doorkeepers. We're just here to open up the hearts of the people, the door of their hearts so they can be led by you, the good shepherd. If you're hurting and full of fear and anxiety and lost without hope, then come home to Jesus today. Let him restore your soul. Let him refresh your spirit. Let him strengthen you with a power so divine and so amazing. It's worth your life. It's worth your all. It's worth pursuing and following. Come home to your Savior. Let him care for you. And God, we ask that you would continue to use us as your sheep here in our sphere of influences to be about your business, God to love, to to care, to point people to you, God, not to burden them down with extra laws and regulations that we ourselves don't even keep. 
but we trust fully in your sacrificial atonement on the cross and we trust in your spirit to lead and guide us into all truth that we would be about your business father united we stand shoulder to shoulder tearing down the darkness and building up your kingdom here until you call us home father may we be men and women with our hands to the plow, our feet to the pavement, and our eyes to the sky on the prize, which is you, Christ, as you lead us home. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.